So make your way over to John chapter 11 as we're kind of getting in halfway through. We started this chapter last Sunday and we're going to be wrapping it up here um, in this service here. And we're picking it up in verse 28. Now what we saw at the beginning of the chapter, we saw a difficult occasion come upon a family. A family that was close to Jesus, Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus. So this family of siblings close to Jesus. And word got out that Lazarus was sick. Well, they sent word to Jesus. And during that time when word was getting to Jesus, Lazarus died. But what's interesting is that Jesus decides to stay two extra days now in the town that he was. He was a little ways away from where they were in Bethany which is just outside Jerusalem, and Jesus delayed his arrival. But he does so, so for a couple of reasons, that there would be no mistaking that Lazarus was really dead. And secondly, to demonstrate the power and the glory of God. This occasion would be an occasion to maximize the glory of God, to reveal who God truly was and reveal that Jesus Christ is his son, that Jesus was able to do all that he claimed to do. And he claimed to Martha in in John 11, verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And so Jesus is demonstrating that for us, that though they may worry and be dismayed, Jesus has it covered because he is I am the resurrection and the life he proclaims. And so we get to see all that unfold here in the rest of this chapter. Now, here's what we're going to be looking at, just to give a bit of an outline here. We're going to see the pain of death. We're going to see the power in Jesus. We'll look at the problem of the religious leaders, the prophecy from Caiaphas, and then the plot of the Jews. So that's what we're going to see here. Look at verse 28 with me. And we read here. And when she, Martha... Had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So what we see, first of all, is Martha, who was previously meeting with Jesus, weeping, mourning. She's heavy over this predicament that's gone on, burdened down over the loss of her brother. And again, she says, like Mary does, Jesus, if you'd just been here. Everything would have been fine. But then we saw Jesus revealing who he is to her and to all of us. And we see Martha beginning to kind of grow in her faith because she says there at the end of what we looked at last week, verse 27, she goes, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ or the Messiah, the promised one, that you are the son of God who is to come into the world. See, Martha's faith began to grow as a result of this occasion, which is oftentimes why the Lord also allows things into our lives that sometimes we don't like. Because it brings us to a point, almost forces us to a place to say, Jesus, I need you. I need to put my trust, my faith in you. And as Martha's faith is growing, what's it doing? It's causing her to be able to move on now. To move on now to see even greater things. Now, there's still room for her faith to grow as we're gonna see as we get into this chapter. There's still some room for her to continue on in her faith, but right now she's moving on in belief in who Jesus is. She's going back home and she's inviting Mary now to come and meet with Jesus. And that's an important thing for all of us here is that we be those that are walking by faith, growing in our faith. Because if we're not growing in our faith, we're gonna constantly be kind of held back, stunted in a sense. But here's Martha now moving on as her faith is growing, trusting in the Lord. And she lets Martha know something wonderful here. She says, That the teacher has come and is calling for you. The teacher was calling. Jesus was calling out to Mary to come and meet with him. In her place of pain and sorrow, Jesus is calling out to her. I think that would be so wonderful for Mary to hear that, wouldn't it? She's sitting at home and she's distraught. But now to hear those words, Jesus has come. and And he's calling out to you. 
Do we understand that for ourselves? That this is the reality even for us that Jesus is calling out to us. Calling out to us to come and and meet with him. To come and bring our burdens to him. To come and pour out our heart before him at his feet. Jesus has made an invitation for all of us to simply come unto him. And to receive from him the things that we need. That's the God, the Jesus that we serve. It tells us in, in Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. That's a great reality for us. Have we taken advantage of that? Where do you turn when your heart is heavy? When there's sorrow, when you're distraught, where do you turn? Are you looking to other people? Are you looking to other resources to perhaps pick you up or to find comfort in? Because Jesus says, come to me. He's calling out for all of us to say, come and find refuge in me. Come and pour out your heart before me because he loves us. He cares for us. And we're going to see that as we move along here even more clearly. So Mary comes and what does she do? She takes that familiar position where? At the feet of Jesus. Oh, it's not a great thing to do. Every time we see Mary in God's word, we find her oftentimes sitting there at the feet of Jesus. I think it was at that place where she could really say, Jesus, I'm looking to you to be all that I need. I'm, I'm laying my life down. That's oftentimes that place of submission, right? Coming and being at the feet of someone, you're bringing that submission. And here's Mary's heart. It's a heart of submission unto Jesus, where she's recognizing, Jesus, I need you. I've got nothing without you. And so, Lord, I'm coming. I'm laying everything down. Even, even our burdens, our hurts, we come and we bring that to Jesus in submission. We lay it down. And so there she is at the feet of Jesus. But it's interesting because she's repeating almost verbatim what Martha had, had previously said. Because Mary says there in verse 32 at the end, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So again, there's kind of that, I, I think perhaps maybe it's being said in a bit of a different tone than Martha may have said it. They were very different personalities and characters, but here's Mary nonetheless, you know, distraught. Lord, if you'd just been here, just, if you had just come and done that work, then Lord, all this would have been taken care of and would have been fine. But here Jesus is going to have an opportunity again just to reveal his greatness and what he's going to do. And look at verse 33. It says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Here we have the shortest verse in the Bible. Also the most memorized verse in the Bible, right? The verse that everybody goes to say, oh, I know the Bible. Sure, I can quote the Bible. Jesus wept. There it is. All right. Pretty good, right? And everybody loves that verse because it's the most easiest verse to memorize. But though it's the shortest verse in the Bible, it's also one of those verses that are probably one of the more complex ones to fully grasp and understand. Because we ask, why was Jesus weeping? Why did Jesus weep? We've all heard it. But have you ever stopped to go, why was Jesus weeping? Was he weeping over the fact that his good friend Lazarus had died? Well, Jesus knew what he was coming to do. Jesus had already told his disciples at the beginning of the chapter, days before he even got there, this sickness is not unto death. Jesus knew what was going to happen. So it doesn't seem to fit that he'd be weeping over his death when he knew that, oh, he's not, gonna, he's not dead. I'm going to raise him. I'm going to wake him up. I'm going to raise him back to life. Was he perhaps weeping over the fact that he's seeing all the kind of unbelief among people, that they're distraught, they're heavy? Was it over unbelief? Well, we've also seen Jesus time and time again ministering in conditions and situations where people were filled with unbelief and it never brought Jesus to tears before. Perhaps, and I think the most likeliest of scenarios, and though we can never know for sure, but I think what Jesus was really experiencing was just seeing the fallout the ramifications, the consequences of sin. Because what do we know sin does? Romans 6, 23, that the wages or the cost of sin is what? Yeah. Death. See, this was never the design or the purpose of God when he created the world. When he created us, he created us so we'd have fellowship with him and that that would continue on. But because of that first man and woman that brought 
disobedience, rebellion against God. They brought sin into the world. Well, now the, sin, the world is under a curse. It's never the way that God fully intended it to be. And so Jesus is here and he's seeing the fallout now of sin. He's seeing that sin brings hurt. It brings pain. And ultimately it brings death. Yes. And Jesus is here and he's seeing the heaviness of people. They're weeping. They're sorrowful because of the very reality of what sin does. And I believe Jesus is here weeping over that, troubled over it. Just as when he came into Jerusalem, again in those last days before the cross, that he comes into Jerusalem and, and he's weeping over the city because they had rejected him. And he's weeping and troubled over the fact that they would turn on him and not receive the help they needed to be forgiven of their sin. So Jesus is troubled over these things, it says. He's sorrowful. This isn't Jesus weeping over the fact that, oh, we've lost somebody. He's not weeping for the dead. He's weeping with the living. And he's coming alongside them in the sorrow, which I think is so important. Because notice what Romans 12, 15 says. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, here's what Jesus is doing. He's coming alongside them and he's, he's experiencing their sorrow and their pain and he's weeping with them. He's seeing what, what sin does. And I'm so grateful that we have a savior that not just took on humanity, not just came to this world to do a work for us that we can do, but he came and he tasted of the sorrow and the pain of what sin brings to people. He experienced those things himself, you see. He knows what it's like. He, he knows your pain. He knows your hurt. He knows your sorrow because he partook of that himself. He didn't just come alongside these people and say, oh, guys, get over this already. Don't you have faith in what I'm getting? He didn't start rebuking people. He wept with them. I think that's a wonderful ministry to have because I think all too often what we feel we need to do when we have a brother or sister that's weeping or going through a hard time we think we got to come in and we got to say the right thing to pick them up to make everything better we want to fix it don't we want to do that oftentimes don't you don't you fall in that trap I fall in that trap where I'm like okay I got to say the right thing oh it's going to be okay everything's fine oh don't worry about it. and we just want to try to make them feel better but they're grieving they're like listen I, I, I might know that he's going to be fine. But right now, I just need somebody that will just weep with me. And the Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice, but also weep with those who weep. That's an important ministry to have, to come alongside somebody and say, hey, I, I might not know exactly what you're going through. I may not have all the answers for you, but I'm here with you. And man, I'll, I'll be a shoulder to cry on. I'll cry with you. I'll I'll be here just to uphold you in this time. And I'm just here to weep with you. That's an important ministry to have, to come alongside somebody and just love upon them and support them. I know definitely, yeah, point them to Jesus, pray with them. We, we know what our hope is, but sometimes people just need to know that you care. You're not trying to solve the issue. You're just there to, to be with them in their pain and in their hurt. And Jesus is, is in a sense doing that very thing here now with these people. And I'm so glad that we have a savior like this, right? Because again, so oftentimes I think, oh, well, Jesus doesn't understand. He doesn't understand my hurt, my pain, what I'm going through. Listen, let me tell you, he does. He knows it better than anybody. He knows it better than you do yourself. And he's invited us to say, hey, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You'll find rest for your souls. He wants you to pour out your heart to him as we saw there. Pour out your heart to him and find comfort, find strength in him because he understands and he cares. He loves you. I'm so glad for that. Now, this is interesting because to the mind of the ancient Greek, the primary characteristic of God was apatheia. They just saw God as being totally in a having that total inability to feel any emotion whatsoever. You see, the Greeks believed in an isolated, passionless, 
and compassionless God. They thought he doesn't care. He doesn't want to deal with human emotions or what we're going through. He's just some, so completely removed and outside of that. But guess what? That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God that we see here and who's really there for us. And Jesus is showing that. He comes alongside them weeping. Two simple words. Shortest verse in the Bible. Yet reveals so much to us about the heart of God. And the love and the compassion of our Savior. What a blessing it is to have a Savior like that that we go to in our time of need. Where we find grace and compassion and help. Well, we continue on here in verse 36. And it says this. Then the Jews, uh, then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? So most of the crowds, they're, they're all thinking that Jesus is simply weeping for this man, Lazarus, whom he loved, who he had a great relationship with. And he's just, Jesus is just sorrowful. Oh, Lazarus, we're going to miss you. Why did you have to go so soon? They're all thinking Jesus weeping over Lazarus because he's dead. But they're totally missing it, you see. They're not grasping it. And again, even Martha is not fully grasping the magnitude of the power of Jesus. So that's what we look at next, the power in Jesus. Look at verse 38. Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So though Martha had grown in her faith, had a good understanding of who Jesus was based on verse 27, we see that her faith still had room to grow, right? Because here she's kind of doubting this. She's thinking, hold on a second, Lord. Yeah, I know you're the Messiah. We know you're the promised one. We got it. But do you really want to go there? Like you want to roll away the stone? Because in this climate of the Middle East, it's very hot, very dry. They put a dead body in this tomb, which was a cave, and they would seal it with the stone. So it's very hot in there. And you know what's going to happen to something that's not living? It's going to get, start to decay and get very stinky. That's what she's saying. She's essentially saying here, Lord, if we move away that stone, there's going to be some heavy stank hitting us here. And I don't know if we're prepared for that. I don't know if we want that. She's like, this doesn't sound like a good idea here, Lord. You know, and, and here again, she's failing to really, again, believe what the Lord wants to do. Because the Lord wants to reveal his glory in this. And yet she's worried about all the, the potential issues or hangups. How we need to be careful to just simply follow the Lord. Because what the Lord commands or directs or instructs us in, it's for our good. It's so that he can, again, bring about the fullness of his life. And so oftentimes we question, we wonder, is that really a good idea? Oh, how we need to step out in faith. And just trust the Lord. And sometimes the Lord, you know, again, like I say, he wants to bring about the fullness of his life. And that's why he says, remove that stone. Because I'm going to raise this brother of yours back to life. And I want you to see this and witness this is going to be powerful. But the stone has to be removed away to see this. To see the life that Jesus wants to bring. See, what happens, I think, so often for us is that we love to kind of tuck things away in our lives. We like to kind of hide things. We like to, you know, keep things sort of down and out of the way and not deal with it. Things that ultimately hold us back from experiencing the fullness of life that God has for us. We don't want to deal with it. And sometimes we say, I don't want to deal with it because that's a, that's a, a big hurt. That's a big wound. That's an area of sin that I know if I expose that, it's going to be stinky. It's not going to be pleasant and we hide those things. We, we want to keep them away from the Lord. But the Lord says, we need to remove those things. We, we don't want to have any stone left unturned in our own hearts of things that we might be holding back from or, or keeping away from the Lord. The Lord says, 
let's remove those stones. Let's uncover those things that might be decaying and dying so that the Lord can deal with it and bring life out of it. And that's all that he wants to do. Not, not bring it to the forefront to reveal it to your shame, but to take it away and replace it with his life. But yet so often I think we're resistant to do it because we know it's going to get stinky. We know it's going to be hard. But understand, here's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to bring life out of it and from it. Let's not leave any stone unturned in our own hearts. Let's give it all to the Lord and say, God, what do you want to do? How do you want to work in my heart, in my life? Let me give it to you, Lord, so that you can do your work. And here's what we see in verse 40 again. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, here we see why Jesus had delayed for those two extra days where, where it allowed Lazarus to be dead for four days. Because Jesus wanted to do something even greater than just heal Lazarus from sickness. He wanted to show the ultimate power and glory of God by raising a man that was clearly dead for four days and raise him back to life. He wanted to do a work that would result in a greater measure of God's glory. And all of these people would have the blessing now of witnessing such an incredible work. So he prays this prayer out loud so that they would recognize and see and hear what Jesus was doing, who he was depending on, who he was working for, that he was working with the Father, right? And so he prays to the Father, I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe, that they might believe, that's what Jesus wants to bring them to. That's what all these signs, these seven signs that we see in the Gospel of John, this sign, raising Lazarus to the dead, being the seventh and the most powerful, because again, it's defeating the greatest enemy of humanity, and that is death, and it's revealing the greatest power and glory of Jesus. And Jesus does all these signs so that people would simply believe. What is it that keeps us from really ultimately seeing the glory of God? It's our unbelief. It's our unbelief. If we're not willing to walk forward and trust the Lord and to see these things, well, we're not going to have the privilege of really seeing the work of God. If Martha doesn't step out in faith and remove that stone, they're not going to see the glory of God. The Israelites that were called to go into the promised land, the land that God had given them, why didn't they go in? Because of unbelief. And as a result, they had to stay out in the wilderness for 40 years until they died off. They never got the chance to see the, the, even the greater measure of God's glory by going into the promised land and seeing what he was going to provide for them. Our unbelief oftentimes holds us back from seeing the greatness of God. Not oftentimes, it will hold you back from seeing the greatness of God. May we be those that are walking by faith, trusting the Lord. And as we do, seeing the greatness of God. Look at verse 43. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Now this is so wonderful. Here's Jesus now. He's putting it all out on the line now. And he calls out, Lazarus. Come forth. And it's a good thing, you know, that he calls out Lazarus by name. Because if he just said, come forth, I mean, all the tombs would have emptied, right? But all these people coming out, like the Michael Jackson thriller video all over again, right? I mean, like, oh my goodness. That's the power of God. He just says to the dead, come forth, and they're going to come forth. So it makes it specific. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out bound, it says, Hand and foot. Now this is interesting because I don't know how this all would have looked and how this would have worked, but I mean, he's bound hand and foot. In other words, he's got no power to get himself up and to get himself to the entrance of the cave where everybody sees him, right? I mean, how did that work? Did Jesus just kind of cause him to just sort of, you know, elevate and just sort of float to the entrance of the cave? 
I, I don't know how that looked, how that worked. But not only does Jesus give life back to Lazarus, but he gives him the ability to get up and to begin to move here. And, and here's the great thing. That's how it all goes for us, right? Every single one of us have experienced that life now out of death. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. Look at what Ephesians 2 verse 1 says. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, here's what we recognize. That God alone does his work. Lazarus could do nothing to raise himself up. He's bound hand and foot. So God comes and he gives him life and he raises him up. You and I could do nothing to save ourselves as much as we might have tried in our own works and effort to be right with God, to bring ourselves to God. God does that work. God does that work. We simply recognize our need and we call out for forgiveness in repentance and we ask for salvation. And he does that work. He raises us up from the dead because that's what we see here in Ephesians 2. That we were all dead in trespasses and sins. We were all in that place. And God came and he called out to us and he raised us up. And he's given us life. Now, let me read something to you that Sandy Adams said. He said this, Lazarus typifies every new believer. When Jesus calls our name, we're given new life, raised from spiritual death. But we're still bound in the trappings of the past. Sinful habits, bondage, fear, unbiblical attitudes are all grave clothes. Hey, for you and I to get freed, he goes on to say, for you and I to get freed up to enjoy our new life, those attitudes need to be undressed. Just as the layers of the shroud were unwrapped from Lazarus' body, and guess who's responsible or, or whose responsibility it is to help the new believer shed his grave clothes? Jesus said to the people around Lazarus, loose him and let him go. See, Jesus gives spiritual life, but it's our job, the church, to help new believers who join us get loose from the past and to shed the stuff that keeps them bound. That's a wonderful role and responsibility and work that we all get to function in and, and, and serve one another in. Yes, it's Jesus that gives us life, that raises us up from the dead. But for a lot of people now, the next journey here and the next sometimes long journey is seeing those grave clothes continue to get unwrapped and shed. Because we're all still bringing things in it from our, from our past, from our old nature that we're trying to get stripped away from. That old nature doesn't want to let go. And so it's the, the role of the church as we come alongside one another to continue to encourage one another, support one another, whether it be through prayer, Bible study, discipleship, mentoring, encouraging. We come alongside one another to say, hey, where are you at? I want to see you continue to grow in the Lord. And we want to keep seeing people moving and growing and maturing in their walk, in their faith, where those old grave clothes no longer are, are hanging on, tripping them up, weighing them down, but where they're walking in the fullness of life. Guess what? You who have been Christians for a while, who have been, you know, matured in their faith, find people to come alongside and say, oh man, I would love to just encourage you and, and help you in your walk with the Lord. That's the role, the responsibility, and the blessing that we all get to have in just coming alongside one another. The Lord does the main work, but he partners with us in continuing to see people growing and being discipled. Now, before we move on, let me just say here that um, with Lazarus here, this was more of a resuscitation or revitalization, not a resurrection. Okay? That's important for us to know because Jesus, it tells us that Jesus is, I'm going to see my slides are gone right now. So I'm going to see if we can get those back up here. Um, Jesus here is the first fruits of our resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 
tells us that. If maybe we can see if someone can help put up that one slide with that verse on there. Jesus, it tells us, is the first fruits of our resurrection, meaning that he's the first one that truly rose again to where he rose again, where he didn't need, he left the grave clothes behind, right? He didn't need them any longer. Here's the tragic thing. For Lazarus, he's going to have to die again, right? Maybe that's why Jesus was weeping because he's going, Lazarus, I'm so sorry to do this to you. I know you're hanging on paradise right now and it's so good, but I got to bring you back, man. I got to bring you back to let people see the glory of God here, okay? Sorry about that, Lazarus. And you're going to have to die once more, all right? So keep those grave clothes nearby. But for Jesus, he left them in the grave. He didn't need them any longer. He was given a new body, a resurrected body. So Jesus becomes the first fruits of our resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Jesus is the first. And now there's going to be a succession that's going to continue on in that first resurrection. It's not a one-time event, but it happens over a period of time. When Jesus comes back again, we're going to be given our, our, our glorified, resurrected bodies that are made for eternity. We're going to be given a new body. Right now when we die, yeah, the Bible says that uh, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We're going to be with the Lord in spirit. But there's going to come a day when we're going to experience again part of that first resurrection where we're going to be given our glorified made for eternity body. It's going to be so good. Lazarus, he's going to have to die again. But one day he will have that resurrected body, that resurrection experience. So here we continue on now. And so we've seen the, the power in Jesus. But let's look now at the problem of the religious leaders. See, this is a great work that's going on, but it's not boding so well for these religious leaders. Let's see why. Verse 45, then Mary, or sorry, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So, What's happening is the religious leaders are hearing all that's going on, but they don't like it. Even though what's interesting, they recognize and they admit that Jesus is doing many signs. And they use that word for signs that speak of kind of an unnatural occurrence that's going beyond just the realm of, uh, of you know, natural occurrences. They know that there's something supernatural about this. They know that there's this kind of work of God. Even remember Nicodemus, who is part of the Pharisees. He goes, we know that no one can do the works that you do unless they're of God. So they know really what's going on. They say, they admit, he's doing many signs. But they don't want to believe it because it's messing up their will, their way, their plans. See, they've got an intent in all of this. They got a plan in all this that they want to continue on pushing forward in their way, in their promotion. See, they think if Jesus now really begins to get sort of exalted as the Messiah, well, then Rome's going to step in because they saw the Messiah as a political leader. And they thought, well, Rome's going to get upset at that. They're going to want to overthrow that. And in so doing, they're going to take away the things that we're doing. They're going to put greater restrictions on us. And so that's why the religious leaders say they're going to take away both our place and nation by place they're talking about their own position these guys have built up for themselves positions of of prestige and prominence see what they desired was their own praise rather than praising god they wanted to promote their will and not god's will they want things to go their way and not god's way so they're seeing this as a problem We can't let this happen. Even though they see the truth and the signs, what do they do? They want to suppress the truth. That's what many are doing today. Romans 1 says that they suppress the truth, even going against what they know to be true. That's how many people are dealing with the things that they're dealing with. You you look at the world and you go, the world's just going crazy. In the logic that people are trying to bring up, the things that they're promoting and doing, you just go, how does that work? That's not even reasonable but you see 
I think deep down many people know the reality of what is true. But what do they do? They suppress the truth. They go, okay, I know this not to be right. I know this to be right. But we're going to push that down. We don't want to deal with it. That's why some of these minority groups get so loud and vocal. Because they want to silence the reality of the truth. They want to put it down. They want to suppress it. So they get all the more vocal. They get all the more militant. Because they're just trying to put it down. They know what's right, I believe. And they know that what they're doing is not right. That it's going against God. But just even like these religious leaders, the ones that, that should have known what's the right thing to do, they suppress it, they put it down. We got to get rid of Jesus. If we don't get rid of Jesus, then it's going to be a problem for us. Interesting. Well, let's look at the prophecy of Caiaphas because this now gets exciting. Verse 49 And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. So here's Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest. Now his father-in-law Annas has been the priest the high priest, and his father-in-law, Annas, had continued to wield a lot of influence in in the people and in the nation. That's why when Jesus is arrested, they bring him to Annas, the high priest. Even though Caiaphas was sort of the high priest, as John says, that year he was instituted to that office in AD 18 by the Romans. And so here's Caiaphas, the high priest, but he now begins to speak out. And he's speaking out in a way saying, listen, you guys. And he's kind of speaking down on his fellow religious leaders. He's kind of saying, listen, you bunch of morons. Don't you get it? Don't worry about this. Because they're all saying, what should we do? How do we handle this? He's saying, what's the matter with you guys? Don't you realize it's better that one person die than all the nation perish? And he's saying that to kind of justify their actions. You see, what they're doing is completely sinful. It's completely wrong. It's brutal what they're trying to do. This great man, miracle worker, savior of the world, they've seen all these done and they want to kill him. And they're trying to justify it. Listen, if we don't take him out, it's going to be a real problem for the rest of us. Let's kill him because it'll be better if he dies than all the nation die. But here's the great thing. Though Caiaphas says this, he doesn't realize truly what he's saying. Because God is overruling what his will is to bring about God's will and God's good purposes and plans. Isn't that amazing? God's overruling this. And so God now begins to speak through Caiaphas without Caiaphas even realizing it. That's why John says he didn't speak that of his own authority. But he simply spoke it because he was in that office as the high priest and God decided to use a man like this. That's a great reminder for us. That we have to take everything that we hear and go, Lord, is there something you want me to hear from it? Regardless of who it comes from. Because sometimes we just dismiss it and go, well, look who's saying it. I'm not going to believe that. How many of us would have been like, I'm not listening to anything Caiaphas says. But here God is allowing Caiaphas to prophesy. To speak forth the word of God. To reveal an important reality and truth. To really bring forth the gospel for us. If God can speak through a donkey... If he can speak through me, as I hope he does on a Sunday after Sunday, if God can use vessels like that, then we never can discount who he's going to speak through and how he's going to do it. But what we must always do is line it up with the word of God to say, is this in line with your truth, God? So here's this word going forth. And and the, the truth, the reality is so clear because this is exactly what the gospel is. God allowed one person, Jesus Christ, to come And give his life a ransom for all. That we might be saved. Jesus sacrificed his life. So that we wouldn't have to die. Apart from salvation and perish. Because that was the reality for all of us. If Jesus didn't come and give his life for us. We would have perished in our sin. But Jesus came as the perfect sinless Being fully God and fully man. Fully able to have the power to bring that forgiveness of sin. And being fully man able to represent us in that. One man came 
to die so that not just the nation of Israel, but notice what John says. He adds to it. He says, so that not just the nation only, but also in verse 52, he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. I believe he's speaking of the whole entire world, all those that would believe in him. Jesus did a work that would bring all people into faith and salvation and life in him. That's amazing. And Caiaphas speaks that truth and reality out for us. And look at what we see as we end this chapter here. We see the plot of the Jews. Verse 53. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. So here now we see the plot of the Jews intensifying, that they're really doubling down on just saying, now we really need to take care of this man. We've got to see this man taken out of the way, killed. And so they go all the way up. And notice here now, it says that Jesus all the more avoided the Jews. Really speaking of the religious leaders, the, the antagonists, the ones that were opposing him. Now, Jesus didn't do that because he feared the Jews. He did it because he's living and operating on this divine schedule, timetable, timeline, or, or, or plan of God. Everything that Jesus was doing was leading up to a specific event and to a very specific day as we're going to see in the next couple weeks here. Because what we read here is that Passover is nigh. Passover is drawing to, you know, it's, it's commencement. And so this is the time that God has ordained. That Jesus, that great Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is going to come and he's going to fulfill the Passover. He's going to be that sacrificial lamb. Just as every Jew is to take that lamb into their house, they were to sacrifice it, take the, the, the blood of the lamb, put it on the doorpost there at that first Passover, and God would pass over them. So too, through Jesus, God is able to pass over our sin, bring forgiveness, and bring life out of that which was dead. That's what this chapter unfolds to us. And Jesus is nearing that day. Even though we're halfway in, in the book of John, we're leading right up now to the last few days of Jesus' life and ministry. And the next few chapters are going to really emphasize these kind of personal encounters that Jesus has as he takes those last few days to really pour into his disciples, pour into those that are of faith and, and to minister to them and encourage them. So we're going to see some great and wonderful things for us there. But here we're at that point to that appointed time now for Jesus to come and lay his life down. Nobody's going to take it from him. He's going to lay it down of his own accord as a sacrifice, as the one that would die in place of the whole world so that we might have life. And that life is evident and seen in Lazarus being raised from the dead. That's the same life that he has for you and for me. Praise the Lord for that. I'm going to invite um, worship team to come up. We're going to just close with a song here and would you stand with me as we just take some time and ask the Lord to, again, just continue to reveal these things to our hearts and lives that he wants us to kind of really take home and, and, and chew on and, and learn from. And maybe there's things in your life, as we've seen here today, that you've been kind of holding back in and, and sort of trying to cover over. And the Lord is wanting you just to move that stone away and bring it to him and say, hey, let's deal with this. Let's not see death and decay continue on. Let's see life be poured in. Maybe that's you today and the Lord wants to do that work in your heart. Would you allow him to do that? Maybe you need to pray and ask him to reveal anything and give you that strength to just surrender it over to the Lord. Maybe you've been walking with unbelief of just what God can do in a specific area of your life. Maybe you're going through something and you've just been doubting the Lord. Well, God's given us a chapter like this to say, listen, look at what I can do. Is there anything that I can't do? 
I want to reveal the glory and the greatness of God. He wants to do that in your situation today. Don't let unbelief keep you from seeing the glory of God. Let's surrender these things to the Lord. Let's worship Him and respond to Him here today. I'm going to invite the prayer partners to come and make themselves available in the front here or in the back. And if you just want someone to come alongside you and pray for you, maybe it's an area that you've got in your life that say, I just, man, I don't know how to pray about this. Would you pray for me? They would love to do that. And so just come and meet with them here in the front as we sing and as we just take some time with the Lord here today.